is Talakayan. I am Dr. Nikki Carsi Cruz from the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies at Ateneo de Manila University. With me today, I will be in conversation with two of the wildest women I know on campus. And by that, I mean the people behind the Ateneo Wild, a citizen science program on urban biodiversity. You see, I'm a fan of the Ateneo Wild. Ever since I joined my first nature walk, I have been booking my classes and requesting for more nature walks with my students as well, at least until before the pandemic. We are going to talk today to Abigail Marie Favis of the Department of Environmental Science and the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability and Marie Katrina Constantino or Trinket from the Department of Biology, an avid bird watcher. I am curious to find out their stories for the creative and innovative projects behind the Ateneo Wild. Let's get the conversation started. Hi, Abby. Hi, Trinket. How are you? It's good to be in the same building with you, girls. Hi, Nikki. It's nice to see you. Hi, Trinket. Hi, Abby. Hi, Nikki. I think the last time that we were together was our last nature walk, I think a couple of years ago, no? That's right. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I remember it was raining. I remember it because I destroyed your umbrella. Sorry about that. I was no, using no. it too. It was really to catch. the old umbrella. And, and I remember my shoes got so wet. But you know, your students were that. Yeah. Oh, oh, my students. All of us were basang siso on that walk. But the thing I liked about that nature walk, I mean, I've taken many nature walks with you before. But what made that special? You made us walk on the second floor. I think from Mateo Ritchie, we went up to SEC, um, the, the connecting walkways of the SEC building. And it felt to me like a forest canopy walk. Because prior to that, we were always on the ground looking up. But on that day, forced by the rain, we were looking at the level of the leaves. No? I was so impressed. Do you remember um, what trees we saw at the time? Because you'd point, of course, I don't remember, bad student. No, but do you remember what trees we were looking at? From, from the SEC area? I remember we went through the SEC walkway because it was raining and so we couldn't really go far. We had to stay near where there were roofs. So we pointed out a lot of the native trees in the Mateo Ritchie area and around the SEC area. So we saw Nara trees, right? And the Bani trees and Itil trees and lots more. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here by asking you, um, so to give our audience an idea of what nature walks are like, no? what are the favorite things that when you see them on campus, you get really excited to point them out to, to the people you're touring? Um, I'm going to put you on the spot, Abby. It's like asking a mother to pick her favorite child. What are your favorite trees on campus? And think of your next. What are your favorite wildlife or birds or animals on campus? Maybe Abby, you'll start first. That's a very difficult question to answer, <laughs> Nikki, because we love all of the wildlife on campus. But if I had to point out uh, some of the notable specimens, my favorite will be the bugrass, which is also called the, na the rainbow tree because of its multicolored bark. We only have one of it on campus behind the Jesuit uh, residence, and it's a eucalyptus variety. Um, where did it come from? Uh, why do we have only one? Can't we have more of those colorful trees? Yeah, we'd love to have more of them on campus. Uh, when we talked to some of the Jesuits in the Jesuit residence, they told us that it was brought over by a Jesuit who came from Mindanao and they actually planted three, but only one survived. And it's now a very tall and very beautiful uh, tree. How about you, Trinket? What are your favorite wildlife on campus? So I started out as a bird watcher, so people associate me with birds. So I'm going to say my favorite bird on campus. And one of them is the peregrine falcon, which is a migratory bird. And it comes every year on campus, so we're always excited to greet it. It comes during the migration season. And the, the campus security personnel actually report to us when it arrives in October. Okay, now let me backtrack a little and ask you, how did you get started on doing this? Abby, how did this start? It started around 10 years ago. Uh, Trinket and I, by chance, discovered a shared interest for urban biodiversity. And we started just for fun organizing bird walks for the campus. And at that time, we were doing it very sporadically, just when we had the time to do it and time to organize. We didn't... Uh, 
ramp up our activities until around 2018. So until around just a few years ago. You know, that surprises me because I always thought this was a strategic plan. You know, you come from the Institute of Sustainability. So I'm thinking this must have been part of the sustainability plan on campus. It's surprising to know that this is just an idea between two friends uh, figuring things out that they like to do the same things together. But why do you continue to do this trinket? What's the, I don't know, objectives or advocacy of, of the Ateneo Wild? Well, Abby and I found each other because we were both um, interested in wildlife and we enjoyed spending time outdoors. But of course, as working working people who live in the city, our art outdoors are very limited. We can't go uh, out of town all the time. But we realized that green spaces in the city actually hold a lot of surprises, a lot of birds, a lot of butterflies, a lot of trees. And it was like opening a whole new world right where we live. And so this is why we want to share that, uh, that, that the treasures of the city with everyone. I was very impressed when you shared those treasures with me because I'm always parking in Ateneo in front of a field. And when you showed me what to look at, it just made my walk from the parking lot to my office much better because parang, parang my parents I'm shifted. Uh, I was very impressed with you when I joined your nature walk because, you know, you were complete with materials. You had binoculars that look legit, not the ones I own. Uh, these ones were, you also had the scope and you let us take a peek to see birds from far away. Uh, that sounds like something very formal. So how did you get that? Did you get funding for that? You look very professional and organized. We were very lucky, Nikki, to receive a grant uh, from the FAURA grant, we applied uh, under our project, uh, The Birds and the Trees. The birds and that trees. gave us the resources to buy and purchase equipment that will enhance the nature walk for everybody. We, we planned the nature walk so that we could share with everybody what you can see in the city. And of course, having these optics enhances the experience. It allows people to observe things up close and use their, use their skills, use their eyes, use their ears in order to find out what's around them. Abby and Trinket, let's talk about your social media page. I follow your Facebook page and I really find the Ateneo Wilds posts and captions very engaging. Who writes those captions? They're very witty, huh? Thank Is you, you Nikki. Uh, Trinket and I take turns writing the captions and we, we have fun with it, focusing on interesting trivia, what we want the community to know, even local names. And it's, it's also a new activity for us because Trinket and I, were not really zoologists or botanists or experts in biodiversity. So we're also excited to do the research and the background uh, checks on, on what you write and include in the captions. Wait, what are your backgrounds? Because I see the two of you, you hear environmental science, you hear biology. Of course, I think you're scientists. And I'm always afraid when I'm talking to scientists that, you know, I might feel less than smart when I'm talking to you. But you two are very approachable. What, what are your fields, if not zoology or botany? Yeah, my background is environmental sanitation, although lately I've been more involved in sustainability research. So... Botany and zoology are not part of my technical expertise. How <laughs> are you trinket? Yeah, I'm in, I'm with the Department of Biology, but my training is really in molecular biology. So it really has nothing to do with ecology or the environment. But I got into this because I am a bird watcher and it got me interested in biodiversity. So do you take those pictures yourself? Um, the things that you post? Yes, we take uh, the photos ourselves, uh, a lot of what we post, but um, we also have a lot of things that we feature which are submitted by the community and that really excites us that the community is getting involved because that's what we developed the program for. We wanted it to be a citizen science program where the community pitches in to help us get to know what's out there. Uh, Abby and I, are we're only four eyes and that's not enough to uh, observe everything and and so through the social media, we wanted to introduce to people what they could possibly see out there. And we were very successful because they would report and we would share their reportings also on the social media pages. Of the contributions from citizen scientists, can you share some that are memorable to you? Maybe we start with you, Abby. 
Well, I always enjoy receiving reports of the Bayawak, the Philippine Water Monitor. This is one of the largest reptiles we have on campus and they're very, very shy. So it's not something we encounter often. So it's very exciting to know that they're thriving on campus and that people are spotting them in different places. How about you, Trinket? Well, for me, some of my favorite citizen scientists are the residents of the San Jose Seminary, and they always report something new and exciting. For example, uh, they had reported the, uh, a squirrel, the Finlayson squirrel, which is actually an invasive species. And it's being monitored because we don't want it to reach the natural areas, the Sierra Madre Forest. So it was quite a worrying, but also exciting to find out that it has already reached our campus and they sent us photos of the squirrel. Um, do you get stories from, I don't know, faculty, from students, from staff, or from all of the above probably? Definitely. Uh, how about the guards? Are they the ones who are always roaming the campus? Do you have stories of what kinds of things the guards would report to you? Yes, they're actually one of our partners in citizen science as well. So we rely a lot on our staff. They're, they're our eyes on the ground. They're here all the time. And one of our favorite encounters with them is we have, uh, we know that the Peregrine Falcon is here because the security personnel from the Manila Observatory would be excited to message us and say when they arrive every October or they also give us periodic updates if they haven't seen them in a while and uh, what they're up to and, and how they sound and where they stay on campus. Where do they, wait, where do they stay on campus, the Peregrine Falcons? The peregrine falcons, they like to, to hang out in very tall areas. So on campus, they're usually found in the cell site towers. So they're normally behind or usually found behind the Manila Observatory. And you, Trinket, you have stories from guards reporting. Um, well, it's not fighting. only the yeah, it's not only the security personnel and the maintenance personnel, but the faculty also. A lot of the faculty work um, uh, well into the night, and there was one report of a ten-foot python which was crossing the steps at Barangka at midnight, and that was a great sighting because normally you wouldn't see these wild animals out in the open during the day. Okay, those are exciting stories reported by people themselves. So how would, how would anybody um, just submit to you? Do they email you? Do they post on Facebook? Do they message you? How do people submit to you um, their contributions? They message us on Facebook or on Instagram. And for those who know us personally, they email us directly uh, their sightings and uh, the photographs and other documentation. Have you ever made a mistake with a post and were you ever corrected by the public or have you ever asked for help in IDing, I don't know, a plant or an animal? Definitely. Uh, we are, as, as we had said earlier, we're not really experts in this field, but we're very happy that it's actually quite, a, quite an active uh, community. And we always ask help from people like the Pl Philippine Native Plants Conservation Society. We ask help from entomologists at the uh, Natural History Museum, and they always help us out with identification. Because I remember making a mistake when I walk with you, <laughs> nature walk, I took pictures and I said, look at the lovely Nara flowers. And then you told me, those are CR flowers, not Nara flowers. Oops. But did, uh, do you remember, Abby, ever making a mistake that you had to um, revise? Yeah, we, we, that happens sometimes, especially when we try to identify to the species level. So very kindly, people will comment and, and, and give us cor uh, more correct uh, identification and we're happy to acknowledge them and we're happy to learn from uh, from them also and also correct uh, the information in our post. So continuing with identification, I want to draw attention to one of my favorite things that you have, which is the coloring book. Uh, I bought these um, plant native trees coloring book to help me identify the Nara tree. You know, my daughter's named Nara, but I had difficulty identifying the NARA and uh, differentiating it from the CR. So can you tell me about these coloring books? How did you come up with this idea? 
Well, we have to acknowledge Dr. Achut Kuyugeng. She was really the one who pushed us to to publish a series of coloring books. So it was a very exciting uh, activity. And one of the goals of Chinkat and I in creating this coloring book is not just helping the community know what's out there, but also giving them an, a mindful opportunity to notice details about uh, the features of the wildlife. So we provide uh, photos and then uh, we worked with Ia Regalario, who's a visual artist and also an alumna of the Ateneo and Ia created these beautiful black and white illustrations for them to color in. Yeah, and it was great because when Ia was telling us how she concept conceptualized it, it was really a challenge for her because she had to do things in black and white because it is a coloring book and in line drawing. So she really said that it really uh, helped her look at details, for example, of how the leaves were arranged or what the flowers looked like. And so that was really uh, part of our goal for making the coloring books. How did you choose which species would make it to this coloring book? Um, what was the curation process or the selection process? Were there debates on what to include and not to include? Was it just the two of you who made the selection process? We actually worked with Ia on that, but Ia had this very brilliant idea of connecting all of the different covers together. So actually, when you put them together, it creates... Uh, a complete a complete picture and there's a representative tree a representative bird representative wildflowers and representative uh, lepidoptera or butterflies and moths on the cover so it's actually a, a puzzle <laughs> so you can collect all four and, and create that picture so we have the birds the flowers the um, butterflies and the trees how did this bird make it to the cover <laughs> for example why this bird <laughs> Well, that's a colored kingfisher, and of course, it's very representative of the Ateneo because it's a blue and white, blue and white. bird. And it's actually one of the birds which really spark interest on our nature walks when we see it and we point it out. And people say, oh, there's a blue bird in Ateneo, and that's the colored kingfisher. Um, did you select the birds here based mostly on their color, or are these resident birds? What's the selection criteria for what made it to the coloring book? So we had different criteria for selecting. Uh, first, we wanted to feature what would what the community would commonly see. So these are common trees or common birds that you might encounter uh, on campus. And then, of course, we had to also feature the ones that would be exciting to color. So we had to choose also based on the features and the interesting details and, of course, the, the visual impact that these uh, organisms would have once it's translated on, uh, as a coloring book. And Trinket? Yeah, so that's how we chose. It was a combination of what's uh, commonly encountered and also what would be exciting to color. You know, this is very tita of me to say so, but this coloring book is a very mindful activity. I really enjoy doing it. It's calming. And especially now during the pandemic, you want to be in touch with nature, but you're stuck at home. And this is another way to allow our impulse to get connected with nature. And of course, I needed to learn how to ID the trees. So these are really wonderful. Um, it reminds me of another thing that I really was impressed by during the first nature walk that I took with you. It's the field guide, you know. Not only did you hand us binoculars, you also handed us this folded field guide that had maps of where to go around campus so that we could walk on our own. And I saw that the coloring book has some of these maps and some of these routes and a checklist for things to look out for. And I had a sense of that with the field guide that you gave before. Can you talk about that field guide? It was a wonderfully illustrated field guide. Who helped you make that? So the field guide actually came out of a collaboration. We were privileged to be given a sandbox residency. That was our first sandbox residency. And we worked with Tracy Monsod and Ponzi Solinko of the Fine Arts Department. And we talked about the bird walks and the nature walks that we would have. And they would give ideas on how we can enhance the experience. We actually walked together so they can uh, get a feel of what we were trying to do. And they suggested maybe we can have a field guide to, to give to your 
uh, participants and the field guide contains uh, not just some images of the birds that we might commonly encounter but also uh, routes and maps and some tips on how they can do the walks themselves because our nature walks are very small groups as uh, necessary so we don't scare away the wildlife with with a big uh, rowdy group so uh, we wanted uh, to give an opportunity for others to do the nature the nature walks themselves yeah one of the biggest challenges of a nature walk and one of the most exciting things is for you to be able to identify something and we started out with birds because those are the among among the most visible of wildlife and so uh, we show several birds which can be commonly encountered not only on campus but in urban areas in the philippines in general and so they were illustrated by ponzi and tracy uh what's interesting is after we took ponzi and tracy on a nature walk to show them what we were doing, Ponzi had realized that sound was a very uh, integral part of the experience. And so we tried to include the sounds of the birds, the calls of the birds in the uh, in the nature walk guide by phoneticizing the bird oh calls. And it was one of the fun and uh, challenging things to do for that. Can you give us a sample of how you phoneticize <laughs> the sound of a bird and put it on paper? So there's a bird How do you spell called the sound of a bird. So Trinket and I just have fun with trying to sound it out and figuring out how to put them into words. So for example, you have the brown shrike, which is a migratory bird, and it goes ta 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 ta. So you just have to figure out how to put them into words. And actually, the local names of many of our birds are onomatopoeic. So it's based on the sound that they that they make. So it's actually a, a fun activity for Trinket and I to, to do that. Yeah, I only hear onomatopoeic, you know, that kind of word in a literature class. And here I am talking to a, a group of scientists using onomatopoeia. Um, is there any other samples? So we have ratatatatat. Is there any other kind of bird call that you had to spell and write down? Yeah, the, the zebra dove, for example, or the bato bato, it's a common bird you see walking on the sidewalk. The local name is actually kurukutuk. And if you probably listen early in the morning, you might hear them cooing, kurukutuk, kurukutuk. So those are some of the more easier ones. But the, there are some that were really hard to put into words. For example, how do you put a z, 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 z? So this is one of the challenging things, really, that we did. I, I noticed that you used illustrations rather than photographs. Why is that? Well, illustrations can give us the flexibility to focus uh, and exaggerate some features that would be useful when uh, people are out and looking at the bird and trying to identify them because birds can look different. The same bird can look different <laughs> depending on the time of year or the pose that it has. So it, we found that it would be easier to help people identify by focusing on certain features and certain colors that are indicative of that bird or that are unique uh, of that bird. And that's, that's, that's the advantage of using illustrations instead of just photographs. It's just really wonderful when scientists and artists work together. You know, this interdisciplinary collaboration is just really so exciting to me. But I heard it's not just the visual artists that you were working with. You also worked with people who um, know about sound. I think that was your next sandbox um, evolution. Tell us about the, what came after the field guide. So because the sound... We, we emphasized sound in the field guide. We realized how important it was to the experience. And so the Arete Sandbox Projects put us in touch with um, soundscape specialists. So we worked with Aaron Vicencio and started recording not only bird sounds, but uh, the sounds of the campus. Uh, sounds caused not only by living things, but also by people and by 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 the environment. So the wind in the trees, uh, the, the footsteps of people, the bell in the morning, and it really gives another dimension to the experience of a walk. My gosh, sound does a lot to trigger memories and they also evoke a lot of association. So if I wanna hear the sounds of the campus that I miss so much, where can I go? Um, is there a repository of sounds that 
that are available for the public. Okay, so we have a publicly accessible SoundCloud account where we store sounds from the campus, from geophony or the sound of the wind, the sound of the rain, biophony, which is the sound of living things, uh, and anthropony, which is the sound coming from human activities. So during the pandemic, how has the Ateneo Wild remained active in engaging, you know, citizen scientists? So at first we were really challenged by it because uh, most of our projects are really based on uh, the experience of a nature walk and all of a sudden that was taken uh, away from us by the pandemic and by lockdowns and quarantines. But we were able to continue with our social media pages and that really introduced us to a whole new audience of people beyond the Ateneo community. So in a way, it, uh, it actually uh, helped us discover uh, a new audience. Have you made the field guide illustrations and all the sounds that you have collected available to the public? Yeah, so as Trinket mentioned, so the pandemic really opened up new opportunities and new lines of investigation and new lines of interpretation. So one of the things that we did with some of the material we already had was to create a flashcard series connecting the images with the sound, the actual sound. So we worked with Janina Castro of the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability and we came up with a flashcard set called the Dawn Chorus. And each of these cards would have uh, featured the bird, the illustration of Tracy and Ponzi. And there would be a QR code connecting it to an audio file so you can uh, listen to the actual sound that the bird will make. And of course, there's the local and common names as well on the cards. When I hear yes. the word flashcard, I think of children. <laughs> you know, you, you give them mathematics flashcards. Are these designed for children or also adults at heart, uh, kids at heart like me. Are, are these um, accessible for children? So we designed them with children in mind, but it was actually a wider audience because on lockdown, people became more sensitive to their environment as they were at home. And so while it's primarily targeting children, uh, the audience uh, really is anyone who, was in, who is interested in bird song and bird call and identifying the birds because often you hear something, but you don't associate anything visual to it. So by using the flash flashcards, you have the 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 auditory cue and you have a visual cue also and uh, because uh, the flashcard series were so successful we also had a follow-up uh, project together with forest foundation philippines and this time we featured um, urban biodiversity concepts on flashcards as well do you have are these an alphabet you know is there an alphabet yeah so the city wild Yes, the City Wild uh, flashcards is an alphabet flashcard. So it's actually the whole title is the City Wild uh, from A to Z. So we have words uh, and concepts and species or organisms uh, across the entire alphabet. And it's very what, what? exciting because we also worked with another uh, alumna of the Ateneo, another artist, uh, and she made beautiful illustrations of the concepts and also the organisms that are featured on the flashcard. Taking a sample, what was letter A? A is aposematic, <laughs> which is which means it's it's warning coloration. So you know how some organisms are brightly colored, and it's actually a signal for you to leave them alone. Yeah, and beyond the and beyond the concept, the flashcards also feature some activity that you can do. So it's an activity for uh, children who are studying at home, for homeschooled children, or for uh, for 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 students who are just looking for science activities that they could do at home. You know, I have to ask you, if people are interested in doing something like this, taking initiative to organize, whether in their neighborhoods or in their own schools, a citizen science program like yours, do you have any tips or advice for them? Before I ask you for, for your advice, I, I do want to ask, when you started this out, did you ask help from other people or did you go to the forests in Ateneo and, you know, like we were trailblazers creating a path through the forest? How, how did you make those trails? Oh, Nikki, we actually don't make any trails because okay. we also don't want to 
disturb the integrity of our green spaces. So when we take community, the community on our nature walks, we actually go on established trails already. But when Trinket and I do our own walks, when we do our biodiversity inventory, of course, we, uh, we're also curious to know what's in the wild spaces. So sometimes we do go into the wilder areas on campus with permission, of course, from uh, the administration. And we just exercise prudence and safety, but we don't disturb any vegetation. So we don't make new trails or, or forge new paths in those areas. You really have a lot of creative and innovative projects. So what's in store? Do you have other future plans and future directions for the Ateneo Wild? We have so many more <laughs> ideas and plans that we want to do. And one of the things that Trinket and I are currently discussing is we're planning to create a calendar, a phenology calendar, or like an, an almanac of the different uh, the different flowering uh, times and the different seasonal changes that we experience uh, on campus. And, you know, that's one of the exciting things about the campus. It's not the same at any given time of year. And every time we do our nature walks and, and all of our different explorations on campus, there's always something different that's happening. So that, that's something that Trinket and I are excited to do. If people want to put up their own citizen science programs and initiatives for urban biodiversity, maybe as a parting shot, would you have some advice on how they can be wild? You know, Nikki, what's great about the Ateneo Wild is the evolution of it was very organic. And so uh, we started to have a, a small network of people. We built up a small network of people. For example, now there's the UP Wild also. And so our dream is really to come up with a, a, a community of wild people and to help, that, to help uh, people out in setting up their own projects, their own citizen science projects. We also work with... Uh, Forest Foundation Philippines in coming up with a manual. Uh, it's entitled How to Be Wild, Setting Up Your uh, Citizen Science Program, and it's available also online for free. And it gives people some ideas on how they can promote urban biodiversity, how they can set up their projects, any problems they might be able to solve uh, using citizen science. I wish we could continue talking some more, but it's time to say goodbye. Abby, if people still want to look up uh, the Ateneo Wild, where can they go to continue to see the things that you do? Please visit us on Facebook, on Instagram, at the Ateneo Wild. Abby Trinket, thank you very much. Not just for all the work you do with the Ateneo Wild, but for this conversation, which has truly been a lot of fun. With Abby Favis and Trinket Constantino of the Ateneo Wild, I am Nikki Carsi Cruz, and this has been Talakayan. Remember, there's a citizen scientist in all of us. And if we open our hearts and minds and eyes and ears to the beauty of wildlife that abounds wherever we are, we will know that for all its sham and drudgery, it's still a beautiful world. Thank you for joining us.